Uh, my name is Anita Krug, and I am uh, the interim uh, dean here at the School of Law. And uh, just welcome everyone. I uh, am so pleased to see you all here. We uh, uh, here at, at the University of Washington are so pleased to be hosting today's program. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Gorton, for a lifetime of service. We are so happy to be part of this event celebrating you and your dedicated work on behalf of the state of Washington and the country. Um, and thank you, uh, Attorney General Ferguson, for uh, all you are doing as our Attorney General and uh, for being generous with your time and, and meeting with our, our students. Uh, it, it really means so much to them and to us as well. So thank you for that, as well as for asking us, the University of Washington School of Law, to partner with you in this event. Again, it's a great honor for us to be able to do that. So um, welcome all and thank you. And it is now my privilege to uh, introduce um, uh, our next panel in which Washington State Solicitor General Noah Purcell will lead a panel about Senator Gorton's Supreme Court cases. Now your packets include biographies of all panel participants, though, so I thought I would provide some additional thoughts that are not contained uh, in your packets in my introductions. And um, to begin with Senator Gorton, um, uh, you know, one thing I was going to talk about in this introduction was how we saved the day for the Seattle Mariners. But uh, <laughs> I understand that uh, that was uh, talked about extensively uh, in the earlier part of the program today, and I wasn't here for that, so I unfortunately uh, missed it. But I just, I guess, when it provided an, an additional tidbit on that that may not have been mentioned earlier. So, um, so Mike McKay, uh, former U.S. Attorney Mike McKay, who I think is in the room with us here today, um, said that uh, saving the Mariners um, is, uh, was an engineering of a public-private bipartisan cross-jurisdictional cross international uh, coalition. Um, so really very, very impressive. Uh, but way, uh, there, there's something that uh, may not be as well known about this event. And so the question is, Senator Gordon, is this true, um, that you pulled your family off a beach in Hawaii to come back and save the Mariners? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, rumor but has I mean, it. But it was, but, but it's close. You're in the, <laughs> the, the right church, but the wrong pew. Okay. <laughs> um, my family and I had had a week-long vacation in Hawaii. Yep. Flew home on a Saturday evening to be met by a battery of uh, television cameras uh -huh. saying, the Mariners are going to leave. What are you going to do about it? To which my answer was, huh? <laughs> 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 the whole thing had taken place. Uh, the, the crisis had arisen literally while we were on our yeah. plane on the way back. So that was so a we crisis. we didn't have to change our geography, but I certainly had to change my my downtime. What you plan to do when you got back. Great. Wonderful. Okay, next, uh, Solicitor General Purcell uh, was just 33 years old when uh, appointed as the Washington State uh, Solicitor General. Uh, in a profile in the Seattle Times, Solicitor General uh, Purcell admitted that uh, Attorney General Ferguson took a chance on hiring him. You see, at the time, he had never done uh, an appellate argument. Uh, but it was a really great hire, I think we can all say. Uh, indeed, uh, one of his adversaries before the Washington State Supreme Court had this to say. Uh, he killed me. He won nine to zero on a case he really should have lost. And of course, you don't do that through luck. Rather, uh, he made, in his adversary's words, very intelligent strategic decisions throughout. Washington is very fortunate to have Solicitor General Purcell in our corner. Um, next, uh, University of Washington prof law professor Catherine Watts uh, is an award-winning professor of administrative and constitutional law here. Uh, together with her faculty colleague, Professor Lisa Mannheim, uh, Professor Watts just uh, has co-authored and just released 
the book, The Limits of Presidential Power, A Citizen's Guide to the Law. Now, this book was described by Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter Linda Greenhouse as a smart and indispensable guide that begins where old fashioned civics leaves off and talks to troubled and puzzled Americans as adults. The authors demonstrate that the future of our democracy is where it's always been, in our hands. If only we learn how to invoke the available limits on the power of the president. So uh, I think it is an, the book is an excellent and really all too uncommon example of top flight scholarship that truly does serve the public interest. And then uh, finally, Professor Eric Schnapper has taught here at the University of Washington School of Law for more than 20 years, and over the course of his career, believe it or not, has handled more than 80 US Supreme Court cases. Uh, during the 2010-2011 term alone, he argued three cases to the US Supreme Court, uh, and, uh, uh, and it's really just uh, amazing. Um, now here's a little known fact about Professor Schnapper. He may very well be the last lawyer, or certainly one of the last lawyers still practicing who argued a case before the Supreme Court when Justice William Douglas uh, was still on the court. Uh, this was with, when he was with the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund, which uh, incidentally Justice Thurgood Marshall headed before he was appointed to the Supreme Court. Now, unfortunately, in this case, before Justice Douglas, uh, the justice voted against him. Uh, but um, uh, as is usual for Professor Schnapper, he won anyway. So not surprising there. And with that, I will uh, turn things over to Solicitor General Purcell. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everybody for being here. I think this is gonna be a really fun panel about one remarkable aspect of uh, Senator Gordon's career as Attorney General, and that is the many, many cases he argued at the US Supreme Court. I'm just gonna give a very brief sort of overview and then, and then we'll dive right in. Uh, so General Gordon argued, I think, a total of 14 cases at the Supreme Court, including 12 in the course of six years between 1974 and 1980. And just to give a sense of how remarkable that is uh, and also how much things have changed, so he was doing roughly two cases every year. Uh, over the last three years at the Supreme Court, all attorneys general across the whole country have done a total of two cases. Uh, so uh, I have argued themselves a total of two cases in the last three years. Uh, and, and General Gordon was doing that uh, basically every year for six years. That's partly uh, about how remarkable his, his time was and how many cases the state of Washington had there. It's also partly about how the practice at the US Supreme Court has changed since then and how uh, there's a much narrower sort of specialized Supreme Court bar now that, that tends to get hired for cases at the Supreme Court. Uh, so anyway, just an interesting aspect of how things have changed over time. Uh, so I'm gonna ask uh, General Gordon some questions about those experiences and also get perspectives from, uh, from Professor Schnapper who has argued at the US Supreme Court many times and honestly was one of the most talented uh, advocates I saw uh, there when I was a clerk. And then also from Professor Watts uh, who clerked for Justice Stevens, if I recall correctly, in uh, 2002 to 2003 about, uh, about the experience of being uh, sort of, um, you know, watching, watching advocates from that perspective and, and what, uh, what goes well and what doesn't. So my very first question was sort of covered in the last panel is about how you prepare. So I wanna ask a little bit more um, nuanced question. You talked about how um, you went to DC several days before each argument and essentially spent several days doing nothing but uh, writing out your answers and uh, practicing them with your, with your team. Uh, did you do a lot of work before that? For example, did you, would you be involved in the writing of the briefs or would you do any moot courts before you left for DC or anything along those lines? The answer to both of those questions is no. I did wow. not, I did okay. not, generally speaking, write the briefs. Uh, I sometimes looked them over and made a few suggestions, but I wasn't really the, uh, uh, the, the author of the brief. And we never did moot courts in, in Olympia. Okay. Uh, before uh, going there, only in uh, Washington, D.C. And I think <clears throat> one of the contributions I made was that <clears throat> I encouraged the National Association of Attorneys General to formalize the creation of moot courts mm -hmm. for uh, attorneys general and, f and for their staffs, for that matter, uh, when, they were, uh, when, when they were to argue there. And so I think the, uh, the facilities for attorneys general across the United States to have outside help for preparation now is greater than it was when I uh, 
when I started. That is my sense. So, so really, it was those uh, four or five days before the argument that you were just uh, cramming, sort of. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I always did. That's what I was as a student, and that's what Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me nervous. Makes me nervous just thinking about it. But <laughs> there, there, there was a very definite element of cramming. Okay. <laughs> Professor Schnapper, how does that compare to your approach when you're going to argue a case at the court? Um, I think the only thing, it was very interesting hearing um, Senator Gordon talk about it. Uh, the only thing that it had in common with the way I prepared was the amount of time that I was there, that I would, I would go three or four days in advance. Um, but my experience was very, and preparation was very different. Um, now, I would have written the brief in a case I argued um, and done all the research and don't, and I think it's really quite atypical of the people who practice there that I, I did that. So. Um, uh, I wouldn't spend much of that time with, with anybody else. Um, the, um, uh, I, didn't, I, I don't write out a, a, a complete argument. I would write out no more than about a page, because my experience is that's about as far as you get before you start getting barrage of questions. You're lucky. Um, <laughs> the, um, but I would try to plan the page very carefully, because the first couple of questions come off something you said, and so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to refer to anything that was a topic I, I, I didn't want to talk, to, talk about. Mm -hmm. um, sort of what you don't mention in that first page that, that you sort of control uh, is really key. Um, in terms of the argument as a whole, what I would try to do is to pick out a, a couple of points, three at most, that I want to try to get across in the half an hour I have. Um, that's about as much as you can fit in. Someone from the SG's office said they, that she referred to it as the elevator argument. If you happen to get in the elevator with the swing justice and the rules of ethics were off and you had about two floors to say something, what, what would you, you say? say? Yeah. And, and I think of it in terms of what do I want them to remember when they leave. Um, and and, and uh, the, uh, even if you've gotten, you've written two merits briefs, which I often would have, um, it's, there's a lot that doesn't work. Um, at some points, that you know, it's like it's a five-part argument. You, you can't get five parts out. There are lots of arguments you don't want to make because they're going to lead to questions that aren't the things you want to talk about. Um, so, so that's that plus the one page is most analogous to what uh, uh, Senator Gordon said. I, I spend most of my time working on questions. Um, and the questions, they come from the briefs for the other side. Um, some come from moot courts. Sometimes you just, I just have to sit and think about, you know, if they ask this, it's a little bit like what you said, what um, the Attorney General said about chess. If, I, if, if they ask a question and I answer it, what will it be the follow-up question and the follow-up question, and think about how it's going to play out. Um, so I typically would have a note, I'd give every question a page in a notebook, typically 50 to 100. Um, and I do it that way in part because I don't want to think of the answer. Most questions um, have multiple possible answers. And, and so having a page for each one allows me to go back and think it through again and again. And I try to figure out what answer it is best to have a sense of a bunch of options. Um, uh, I, the general, uh, excuse me, Senator Gordon at one point talked about thinking on my feet. If I'm thinking on my feet, I haven't prepared. You know, I, I don't want to be in there and doing anything spontaneously. It's much better if I thought about it in advance. So I'll have multiple answers to a question. Um, so I have a range of answers when the question comes up. But also, depending on how much time I want to spend on it. You know, there's some questions you want to talk about and some you don't. So if, say you're on the defense side in a capital punishment case and uh, 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 the Chief Justice says, wasn't it a gory crime? You go, yes. Move on. Done. Yeah. Move on. You don't want to talk about that. But so often, if there's a tough question, you tr I would try to think of short answers in the hope that that will work. Um, and, but I have a series of backups. And so that's a lot of it. Interestingly enough, my experience has been I often find myself doing more research the weekend before as I think through the series of questions and how it might go. Um, I also spend time rethinking the exact legal standard that I'm going to be selling. Um, the court doesn't just want to know who wins. They want to know what legal standard are, are they going to write into the opinion, and therefore they want to know what legal standard you're proposing. Most lawyers totally don't get that. Um, they just come in, they make a bunch of arguments, and it drives the court nuts. Um, so I, you know, I try to 
have a standard thought out in the brief, um, but you end up tweaking it a bit in preparation. The Solicitor General's office often comes in with completely different standards and oral argument than they do with the briefs. It's really annoying if you're on their side and they haven't told you they're going to do it, which they don't. Um, but you spend time, I, I think, uh, tweaking uh, that. Um, I also, this is a rather minor thing, but I, I just always feel it helps atmospherically. I memorize some stuff. Um, I memorize, if there's, a, if there's a section number that's like eight digits with subparts, I memorize that. I memorized dates, um, um, I uh, uh, memorized little details. It just feels like you know what you're doing when you can do that. And, and I was, I remember a case in which the, the chief asked me about some amicus brief, the merits briefs were terrible and the amicus brief was about the best one there was, by a now Judge Patty Millette, and he said, oh, that, that thing, and I said, oh, you mean section 1142B715? And he just gave me this, that, okay? <laughs> Fine. Now you know, you do understand what's going on. So I find that little stuff that helps. It's not really substantive, but I always have a, a list like that. Okay. Did you, uh, did, did you, the court when you were there have the rule that 30 minutes meant 30 minutes, not 29 minutes and 50 seconds or 10? I can remember one time being cut off at 12 o'clock and told I had two more minutes at one o'clock to, to finish oh. my argument. <laughs> uh, I have seen that. They don't have as many arguments in the afternoon as they used to. Mm -hmm. They used to have more cases and they would have four a day. It's more common when I was arguing to have okay. two a day. Um, but they, they definitely, you know, when your time's up, your time's up. There's no question about that. But yes, and I've, I've been, you know, I've been in the middle of an argument and, and we, you know, in the old days, we go to lunch and we come mm -hmm. back and pick up where we were. Now, Professor Watts, uh, you wouldn't necessarily know, I guess, how an advocate prepared, nope. but uh, what techniques, when they were actually up there, did you think uh, worked best with the justices or were most persuasive from, mm -hmm. from what you could see? Professor Schnapper's analogy to the elevator conversation jumps out at me because as a law clerk, when you get to be lucky enough to be a fly on the wall for that year and, and watch advocates argue, the best arguments are those where it feels like a conversation. It feels like you have just bumped into your best friend in the elevator or a good friend in the elevator and you're going back and forth and talking about something in an engaged and a fairly energetic manner often, but not in an aggressive or a combative manner. Um, and that makes sense when you think about the fact that uh, you mentioned, Noah, that, that today there's this kind of, it's a clubbier, more inner circle of elite Supreme Court advocates. So many of the best advocates that I saw are frequently before the court, so the court knows them very well, people like, like Eric. The court knows those advocates well, and there is this rapport and this relationship that I think lends itself to that back and forth of a friendly conversation. One little anecdote along those lines jumps out at me. Um, the chief, it was Rehnquist at the time, it was an argument in affirmative action cases, the Michigan affirmative action cases, and during oral argument, Chief Justice Rehnquist leaned forward and asked a question of the advocate Maureen Mahoney and started the question by saying, well, Maureen, and that was not how you would normally refer to a advocate, you would say Ms. Mahoney or Mr. So-and-so or whoever it was. You wouldn't call that advocate by first name. But Maureen Mahoney had been a, a law clerk to Rehnquist and Rehnquist <laughs> slipped and corrected himself quickly. But that again highlights this kind of conversational nature. It's, it's preparation that leads to that, but it's also that these justices and many of the elite advocates today do have some kind of relationships that help, I think, fuel that conversational nature of the really good advocates that have um, come to the table like you just described with a massive amount of preparation. So I want to ask a question that I didn't actually have on my list, but I'm just so interested in this now, uh, Senator Gordon. If, if, if you hadn't uh, written the briefs, did you ever get to that time in D.C. to prepare and wish the briefs had been written very differently? Uh, you know, why did we say this <laughs> or anything along those lines? I must say that that did happen. Yeah. Right? <laughs> happened now and then. But I, I would interject something that, that reflects both of the, my co-panelists here, and that is the value of experience of having them know you the third or fourth time that, that, that you're there, which makes the conversation much better. You know, I told the story about my disaster with my, my first statement about the, the nature of the Yakima the, the Indian Reservation. If that had been my 10th argument, I suspect I probably would have taken on Justice Douglas on it. 
but it seemed to me to be absolutely pointless to try to do that as, a, as, as, as someone brand new. But maybe from, from my perspective and my own arguments, the greatest value of experience that I came up with was arguing a case about the Washington State uh, gross receipts tax on, in, on interstate businesses. The Supreme Court had had a case, I think involving General Motors on, on that subject, a few years before I argued cases in the Supreme Court, which the state won five to four. They took up essentially the same case. Again, there were, there were no real distinctions on it while I was there. Of the five, four had retired. Of the four dissenters, all were there. <laughs> So I figured I started out I started out down four to one. <laughs> After eight or ten of my own arguments, my own favorite justice was Justice White, whom I never heard ask an irrelevant question, always seemed to me to be at the, the heart of every case. He had written the dissent. And so for that one, I prepared an argument for one justice, not for nine. And uh, it's a narrow narrow road to, uh, to uh, <laughs> navigate, to try to, not to say you dumb cough, you know, you got it wrong, now change your mind and get it right, but to work within what he had said in that previous case and to try to, to uh, say that you can quite consistently come out with a different answer th this time around. That would never have happened in an, in an earlier argument or by someone having his or her first or second, second case. Uh, you get more confident as time goes on. You never lose the adrenaline. It's really high <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you get up there to speak. Uh, but you do get to know some of the peculiarities of the individual justices. What, uh, well, you talked some about that, that interruption from Justice Douglas, which I'm sure was quite memorable. Uh, do you have a, that, is that the single most memorable uh, moment from your arguments there, or is there something else? No, I think the single most memorable moment of my time before the United States Supreme Court was on one of those preparatory days when we were watching arguments okay. to, uh, 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 to acclimate ourselves to it, when a totally incompetent and unprepared lawyer made arguments. We didn't know anything about the case, but you could tell that he was just totally off base three or four minutes into his presentation. And at one point, two of the justices turned their chairs around 180 degrees and, and had his back facing them, were, you know, paying absolutely no attention to him at all. I just, you know, I, I was in horror. I, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want that to happen to you, I huh? so suffered to that guy, I said, I think I'd die if that happened to me. <laughs> and it was certainly an incentive to prepare rightly. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Well, uh, I think it's fair to say that that's probably more rare now. Uh, with uh, more, <laughs> uh, maybe not entirely unheard of, but uh, fresher snapper. What do you think about that? And then, what's your most uh, most memorable moment from an argument that you handled? Um, you know, let me go back to what you said about about the the, the degree of specialization in, yeah, in, the, sure. in the court. Um, the, uh, uh, that has happened, and I think the court's the better for it. I think most members of the court feel that way. Um, and, and I do get involved in cases where um, I, I might have written the brief, but the lawyer who was involved on in the lower court uh, insists on arguing it. Um, and it's often not pretty. It's just the best way to put it. <laughs> and uh, I, you do see justices turn and sort of start exchanging notes with each other. And because of the way that bench is laid out, they become a little harder to see. But the thing that does happen, and it, it, it's terrible when it does, is they just stop asking questions. Yes. That the, the answers are so unhelpful that mm -hmm. they just, you can just see them going, the next 20 minutes of my life is just wasted. I'm just going to have to sit here. So uh, you, I, that, that. I always told people that at the current court, they only stop asking questions if one of two things happen. Either they all realize they all agree, you know, they realize that it's going to be unanimous, and or uh, the advocate's so terrible that they just, just you know, they give up. And maybe I don't know if you agree with that or not, but that's <laughs> um, I, I'm not so sure about they all agree because okay. I, I my sense has always been that each wing of the court feels like its its job is to come and 
and ask questions from that point of view. I mean, I've, you know, I've had cases where, you know, I go there and the tradition, the regular, sus are, you are you taping this? Um, <laughs> I believe so. The more conservative members of the court, may they rest in peace, um, ask aggressive questions. And it happened twice in, in that term when I read three cases. And um, uh, Justice Scalia drove me nuts asking aggressive questions. We won both cases. He wrote both opinions. They were terrific opinions. Um, but I sort of, I sense that that sort of was his role. So I haven't, the, the other time when I think they're sometimes quiet is when it's very technical. Mm -hmm. And they really are working to understand what's going on. And um, I remember one case in which uh, um, uh, it was just really technical and, and the, the, argue, the lawyer, the government was on the other side and the Solicitor General's office said something and the Chief Justice said, would you say that again slowly? <laughs> <laughs> and okay. so I, I, you do see that when it's really technical. Yeah. And, and when it's not sufficiently ideologically driven yeah. that if you were a conservative or liberal, you would know what side you're supposed to be on anyway, right. which is what that means. Professor Watts, what's the most memorable moment you remember from uh, your time as a clerk watching, uh, watching arguments there? There were many that occurred um, in chambers behind the scenes that I probably won't speak to, but one that was public that, that was reported in the newspapers that was really quite memorable for me was when um, Lawrence versus Texas, case involving same-sex um, sexual activity between two consenting adults, was handed down. It was handed down right at the end of the term, so in June, right on the last day as I remember it. Um, and so people knew that it was coming because they were waiting for it, and that meant that the courtroom was packed with people who cared very, very much about how that case was going to be decided by the court. And when the decision was announced from the bench, the courtroom, you could just, it was palpable. You could feel um, the emotion uh, within the courtroom, the tears on people's faces, and the, the just audible kind of silence that fell over the courtroom as people were just listening to see how that case came down. So that, that definitely stands out in my mind. I have, a, I have a, another story or two that yeah. reflect different things about the practice that might be interesting. Um, one of them um, uh, reflects the extent to which um, the lawyers and the law firm that are your opponent one day can be on your side the next. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, one um, year, uh, the lawyer on the other side in the case I argued was Carter Phillips, who's a, a regular there. Um, as it had, my son was working at his firm that summer, that year. Um, and then later in the term, uh, his firm filed a brief on, on our, an amicus brief on my side in a different case. So when it came time for oral argument, um, I realized that I had an extra chair, because there are four chairs on either side. And uh, I was really annoyed the government had filed a brief on the other side. So I thought, well, I'll ask Carter Phillips to sit with me. He's the preeminent defense side lawyer in employment cases, and even Carter Phillips is on my side. So we come in, we sit down, um, Carter's sitting next to me, the court walks in, and Breyer reads the opinion in the case in which we were on opposite sides. <laughs> <laughs> it was a better day for me than for him. Um, and they refer to this story in the, in, in, the, in the firm as the day that Carter was eye candy. <laughs> but, but it illustrated the extent to which, you know, in, in part because it's a limited number of lawyers, in part because that's the nature of practice that a lawyer who was on the one side, on the opposite side in one case could be on your side in the next. And yeah. it, it was just a very dramatic illustration of that. Well, thanks. Senator Gordon, what did you find to be uh, some of the pitfalls or special challenges of arguing at the, at the U.S. Supreme Court? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> it's just that, you know, you're, you're playing in the World Series at Yankee Stadium. Uh -huh. And uh, you want, of course, very badly to win. You also, you don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want them to be able to ask you a question that you have never thought of before. And sometimes I succeeded at that, and there were times when I didn't succeed at, uh, at, 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 at that. But it's just a, any time a lawyer goes into court, that lawyer is going to have a certain increase in, in, in adrenaline. And your, your attention is going to be uh, more sharp. Uh, uh, your <coughs> time either goes too fast or too, slow, or, 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 or too slowly. But I, I think 
my, my main concern when I went to the Supreme Court is do it right. You know, get your case across. Get these people uh, to understand, you know, to un understand why you're on the right side and why they should come up. That, and that this, maybe I disagree with others. I didn't care much about their rationale. I cared about the, you know, the, the you know, the, the, the bottom line result. Uh, and how do you how do you persuade them that you're right? If you're right, you can find a legal basis for it. And by right there, do you mean you always tried to? Um you always tried to sort of talk about the equities more yes. than the law, or, or sort of the well. <laughs> you, you you had them to believe that the equities were on your side. Okay. That didn't mean that you spent all your time talking about it. What was the you, hardest case for you to do that? And if you recall, which one were you struggling the longest to figure out why they should want to rule for you? <laughs> probably one of the most simple. It was when uh, when there was a state by state case, Idaho versus Washington, okay. and we wanted them not to take it up at all. We didn't have very good grounds for them not to take it up at all. We had good grounds on the on the merits of the case, but that was a pretty hard, okay. pretty difficult one to argue. Okay. Uh, Professor Schnapper, how about you? The special sort of pitfalls or challenges of the Supreme Court as opposed to another court? Or well, I think there are two mistakes that happen most often. Um, that are that uh, um, one of them is lawyers who just tell the court everything they know once they're asked about a topic. Uh, with no sense of whether it's any longer responsive or uh, a topic that you want to talk about. So Mr. Chief Justice says it. Grizzly crime, yes, Your Honor. First there was the hatchet, then there was the knife, and, you know. But even if it's not harmful, they're just rattling on and it's not helpful. The other thing um, which um, is particularly hard for people who haven't done this before uh, is, is uh, when the court tests what your standard is by asking you a hypothetical in which under your standard the answer is going to be one that the questioner isn't going to like. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, which is why I spent a lot of time thinking through the standard because I know that's all coming. Um, and so the, the, you know, the member of the court will go, well, what if A, B, C, would you, you know, would the defendant still go free? And clearly the answer that the questioner wants is no. But under your standard, the answer would be yes. And the, the most common mistake people make is, is to say, is to tell the questioner what he wants or she wants to hear and go, oh no, he wouldn't go free. And then someone will say, well now I don't understand your standard because, and then it just goes downhill from there. Uh, you know, you, it's really important to have thought through your standard, but then it's really important to stand your ground and tell people things they don't want to hear. Um, and I, I had an argument once about what's protected activity when you complain about discrimination. And the first m two minutes was a disaster. It was like one question after another. The members of the court were so outraged by the answers I was giving, which I was convinced were right. Dark, uh, Justice Souter had gone over to the dark side of the force, which he did occasionally. Um, and, and it started with a question like, well, would people, people be protected from being fired if they wore a button which said equal pay for women? And I said, <laughs> yes. And I thought they were going to have heart failure. They were so horrified at that answer. Um, but you just have to stand your ground. And it just instinctively people don't want to do that. They want to tell the court what they want to hear. And Professor Watts, what were some of the common, uh, common mistakes you saw uh, advocates make in arguments before the court where they lost, lost their way? <laughs> For the most part, the advocates were excellent. Um, but there were a couple of mistakes that, that I did see repeat themselves. One was calling the justices by the wrong name. So <laughs> when an advocate would use the names, Souter and Breyer would frequently be confused, I think, due to the similarity of their hair. I don't know why else. They don't look that much alike, so I can't quite figure out why that is, but they would frequently be confused. And then the, 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 the confusion that was even, I think, worse than that was um, Ginsburg and O'Connor as the two female justices on the court being confused when they don't look alike at all. That was not, that was not good, and that still happens to this day with the court's um, female justices getting confused by advocates. So I think that was a problem. Another, um, advocates really really refusing to answer the hypotheticals presented to them. You have some justices like a Justice Breyer who's notorious for throwing out just bizarre <laughs> hypotheticals about things like taking your pet snail for a walk in the park in a case involving telecommunications or something along those lines. So granted, the hypos are tough, but it did surprise me how often advocates would really 
just refused to engage in the questions in a way that then created more problems for them because of the pushback, it became more aggressive. Um, and then the last I, I think that jumps out is telling bad jokes. Um, I won't point to an example from the term I was there, so I won't call somebody out, but, but one example I use for my students, Roe versus Wade, um, in that case, the attorney arguing uh, stood up and told a sexist joke to begin his argument. Not, not, not a start, smart strategy to start off your oral argument, and especially not in a case like Roe versus Wade. Okay, let me just say that telling jokes is a high risk maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the things they, that the, that the um, that before you argue, the, um, the, there's a little meeting in the lawyer's lounge with the clerk, and the clerk says, you probably want to not do that. It doesn't work well. Um, th that said, you know, uh, you know, I have done it and had it work. Um, it, um, it, and it partially, it, it, sometimes it goes back to the need to stop a line of questioning. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes uh, there's a, just a turn of phrase that, that worked that way. Um, and I'm still alive, so I, I, but mm -hmm. my, my f the, the first time I did it was actually the first time I argued. And I had, as I, I think you mentioned, you, you go to listen to the arguments beforehand, and, and I do the same thing. And, you know, sometimes you pick things up from an argument that might come up in your case. A right. turn of phrase, a subject, a topic, sometimes you can even refer back to it. And so there was this, this turn of phrase that, 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 uh, um, that, that, that popped up. And uh, they were interested in the difference between positive and negative injunctions. Um, and a positive injunction would be, uh, a negative injunction would be don't discriminate against uh, the, the plaintiff. And a positive injunction would be give him a promotion. And they were into that. And um, I, I was, had a promotion case, so I could sort of see this might happen and sort of went upstairs to the library, did a little research, and came back. And I, I should tell you, I lost the case, and I lost this issue as well, but it controlled the questioning. So I'm arg bobbing, you know, arguing away, and somebody, I think White, said, well, could we issue a, 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 an affirmative injunction giving someone a job? And I said, it wasn't a problem when William Marbury won his commission as Justice of the Peace. And there's this pause, and then they realize that's Marbury against Madison, and they had done it low those 200 years ago. So there's sort of a chuckle, and he stopped asking me <laughs> questions about it, which was the point. Mm -hmm. I still lost, he still wrote a footnote about positive and negative injunctions. But in terms of controlling the conversation, mm -hmm. it worked. But Seems like a relatively safe joke, though. It wasn't sort of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. You asked for it. So, so uh, um, I also lost this case, um, but, but, but this was not safe. Um, so I, I argued a case a number of years ago about what constitute clothes, uh, which was important for a statute which said sometimes you didn't have to be... Works didn't have to be paid for changing clothes, and it was... Very unusual case. Um, and uh, and the, the argument for the other side was, look, if you look at somebody and it looks like clothes, it's clothes. And argument was, no, you have to know what the purpose of it is and what it's made of. And this stuff wasn't actually cl cloth. It was made out of Kevlar. It was there to keep people from catching fire. So you needed to know all this stuff, not just what it looked like. So, um, and, and so but I could see this question coming. And so, um, uh, I think it was Ginsburg who, who said, well, it looks like clothes to me. And so uh, I just ran this little thing, walked right into it. I said, well, you know that story about how if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck? And she said, yeah, it's a duck. I said, well, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, but it's just floating there in the water, and there's a little building next door with a bunch of guys in camouflage gears with guns, it's not a duck. You have to know all the facts. Still lost, <laughs> but it was a more daring joke because I was sort of I lured her into it. Um, oh boy! And, okay, um, but it but it controlled the conversation. I'm still All right. here to tell. The yes, story. still here to to tell the tale. Um, so Senator Gordon, I want to ask you about um, you know a lot has changed at the court since you argued there, but one thing that has not changed is that they still do not allow cameras. They're in many ways sort of behind behind the time. They just started doing electronic filing. Uh, last year, I think it is, and they still don't allow cameras at all in the courtroom. Um, 
What do you think about that, and how do you think things would change if they, if they did? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I was in the Senate when the Senate uh, went from just simply recording uh, debates to televising debates. The critics of that <coughs> were probably <coughs> were probably too extreme as to how much grandstanding it would uh, create, but it certainly it 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 certainly did create a different attitude toward speaking on the floor of the Senate among maybe 30 out of 100 senators mm -hmm. who would. Who, who would use it for a, a form of demagoguery that they would never have bothered with earlier because no one would ever mm -hmm. w would ever have heard of it. Uh, all, all, all in all, <coughs> I think the Senate would work better under the old rules, and I don't see any reason to change the Supreme Court rules. Okay. All right. Well, you would have agreed with my former boss, Justice Souter. He uh, said over his dead body, basically. And uh, <laughs> so... Uh, Professor Watts, what do you think? How, uh, how, how do you think the court would change if they started to allow cameras? I think it would change pretty dramatically. One of the main arguments made by those who think cameras should be brought into the courtroom is, is one of transparency and also one of public confidence. Those, those that are um, advocates of cameras in the courtroom think that the public's confidence in the court would go up if they saw actually how much thought and how much deliberation goes into these oral arguments. Um, but on the flip side, there's the concern that it would make the court overly politicized and I personally worry a lot about the sound bites and the clips being used on the nightly news in a way that kind of contorts and twists what happens at oral argument and that it would make it look political and that the deliberative nature would be left out of that picture. And I also worry about what that might do to the justices. Um, I think it's quite important to have justices that have some connection to reality, that have some ability to go about living a... I'll put you know, quotes around the word normal because, of course, they're in these very powerful positions, but yet they're able to go about their lives in a fairly normal way to the extent that Justice Stevens, my boss, for example, would go to the store and he had this one seafood shop he'd go to regularly, and he was in the store one day buying fish, and there he flashed up on the TV screen, and the man who would routinely sell him his fish had no idea that that was the man before him. So he was able to go about doing his shopping, living his life. And I think if he was flashed across the screens on a more routine basis, that ability to go about living his life would disappear, would dramatically change. And I think that could be problematic for how the court approaches its decision-making process because it would further remove them from the people um, and make it more difficult, perhaps, for them to have the perspective that they need to decide the legal issues facing them. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Maybe we'll come back to some of the other questions. But you just referenced your time in the Senate, and I want to talk about something. Um, I don't know. I, I, I was not able to do complete research about this, but you must be uh, one of the rare people who has both argued a number of cases in the Supreme Court and then also voted as a senator on um, nominations to the Supreme Court. And um, I wonder if your experience arguing there played any role in how you thought about, you know, whether someone was qualified for that position or what sort of uh, what sort of people should be nominated or anything like that. No, uh, the answer to the narrow part of your question would would be no. Uh, it, it didn't affect the way in which I made judgments on, on Supreme Court uh, nominations. But the way that the Senate has dealt with Supreme Court nominations, of course, has changed radically. <laughs> yes. Was involved in that change you know, you know, while, you know, while I was there. And so now, you know, and, and we've seen this, of course, in the last year and over the dispute over the last, uh, over the last nomination. Um, the Supreme Court, over the years, has decided so many questions that affect the way people live, you know, rather than just the abstractions, uh, uh, corporate abstractions and, and, and the like, that the process of nominating and, and confirming uh, justices, particularly for the Supreme Court, but for the Court of Appeals as well, uh, has has grown more and more political and even more and, 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 and more partisan. And <clears throat> I'm beginning to wonder now, it's become so extreme, is, is whether or not you'll get anyone confirmed when you have a president of one party and a significant Senate majority of, uh, of the other. And in a sense, you can even justify that change 
because if the Supreme Court is going to involve itself in almost every corner of our life, um, that, then, then maybe the judgment that that man or woman uh, is a perfectly fine individual, you know, no black marks at all, but I simply disagree with him or her, mm -hmm. and therefore I'm going to vote no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't the standard at, that your, was at not, your time. That was not the standard at the time, but we were beginning to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. Professor Watts or Schnapper, any thoughts on how that uh, process has changed over time and sort of where you see it going? Are we headed towards a time when you can just automatically predict how every justice is going to vote based on who nominated them? That such a question seems to have changed with each comma in it. Doesn't it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a compound question. You can object. Uh, no. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, sir. I don't think we're at the point where we can predict precisely how somebody's going to vote just based on the president that nominated them, but I, but I think we're inching closer towards that. Um, and I have real concerns as somebody who teaches law, who believes in the rule of law, that this process seems to be less and less about assessing somebody's legal qualifications and more and more about their political leanings. And the Judge Garland situation just serves to, to highlight that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I I agree with that. I mean, I, I, um, what's happened in the confirmation process over the last 30 years is very complicated, and I don't think we could begin to sort it all out here, but to the extent that the public perceives that what the court does just depends on who the president is that appoints the member of the court, it really undermines the legitimacy of the court. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are some areas, um, and I think abortion is one of them, where if you had, um, you know, one more conservative justice appointed and the court were to flip on Roe on row against Wade, I think the legitimacy of the court as an institution would really be hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there is a perception that that's sort of how things play out now. I, I, on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't think it's as true as the public perceives it to be. The court has a lot of cases that are very technical that aren't driven by ideology. Um, uh, in the area where I work, employment discrimination, the vast majority of the decisions are not 5-4 decisions, and they don't always break on the lines that you think they would. But the perception that that's going on is bad for the court. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Senator Gordon, I want to ask you about one particular case, and then maybe uh, we'll see if that leads anywhere. But one of the cases you argued actually involved UW Law School, uh, the DeFunis versus Odegaard case. Uh, I might be mispronouncing. Uh, uh, some of those names. Not Odegaard. I went here. I remember the library. Uh, but, uh, but you were defending an affirmative action program at the University of Washington Law School. And uh, I don't know if you know, students here might not know about this case because it's not in many case books or anything because ultimately the court declared it moot and didn't really rule. Five to four. Five to four. Mm -hmm. But it really could have been the Bakke case. I mean, everyone reads the Bakke case in uh, constitutional law, and, uh, and it really could have been that case if the court hadn't declared it moot. And I found it interesting going back and reading those briefs. You know, we, the state was arguing that it was not moot. You were asking the court to rule and to uphold the program. A lot you could ask about that question. Um, I mean, sorry about that case. But um, I mean, I guess I just want to see if you have any recollections of that case that students might find relevant. And in particular, I guess I wonder, uh, in listening to your argument in that case, which I would encourage all the students here to do, uh, some of the points you made, it's almost, uh, I, was, I was curious about whether you got pressure as a Republican uh, Attorney General about what, how exactly to articulate the, the uh, times have changed a lot in terms of the party's alignment on issues like, like affirmative action, but did you get pressure about how to present that case, about how to argue it? Was there, did anyone want you to argue that it was moot so you didn't have to really defend it or anything along those lines? Well, uh, again, the answer to your narrow question is no. Uh, no, no one pressured me to take a position uh, on, you know, on, on, on those grounds. And I certainly didn't have uh, Republican organization people saying, no, you should, you, you know, you should, be on the other, you should be on the other side of the case. We did know from the very beginning that the question of whether or not it was moot was central to, to the case, and we had to present much of our argument uh, on the basis that it, uh, that it was not. And the, I think the first question I was faced with was, well, uh, yeah, Mr. Attorney General, this is February. Uh, Mr. DeFunis is three months from finishing his law degree. Right. Will the University of Washington deprive him of his degree if you win the case? And of course, the, the answer we'd come up with was no, 
but that doesn't mean it's moot, you know, because it, it, it applies to so many other, uh, other people. But we knew that was, that, that was at the heart of it. Now, I think, and you remember, you can maybe even correct me on this, because it was a lot of time ago, and I haven't been <laughs> up to the library to read it any, any time recently. Uh, it was found to be moot five to four. Mm -hmm. One of the four who decided that it was not moot and should be decided was Justice Douglas, yes. and a liberal end of the court. Yep. Justice Douglas would have invalidated every form of, inform of affirmative action. He was the only justice who, whose opinion took on mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the substance of the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, as I remember, effectively said the Fourth Amendment means what it means, mm -hmm. no discrimination. I I did read it. He did write his own separate opinion apart from the mootness finding. I can't remember now exactly what he said about it. Uh, That's right. Yeah, That's yeah, right. okay. So you're remembering, see, you, but I can't remember arguments I did three months ago, and you're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, you remember things like that. Well, yeah. I will say of all of the 14 cases in which I was involved, I had more people wanting to weigh in on what the, the argument was. Every civil rights organization in the country yeah. was doing that. And many of them were criticizing me for arguing the case rather than having the senior attorney general here at the university argue. Oh, really? It, it, it be, because why? I mean, why that, that didn't come up in other cases, or what was the what was? Well, the, it didn't come up in other. Well, it came up in other cases at at, at one level, but this was a very highly publicized uh, case at the time, and they thought it was just going to be a political argument. I see. They thought you wouldn't necessarily no. you'd be too nervous about the politics of it to. No. Interesting, fascinating. Uh, well, again, I'd encourage folks. It's a it's a fascinating case about about a program right here at, at the University of Washington, and uh, and it's uh, it's interesting that they, they certainly could have addressed the merits if they wanted to, and it seems like the court just wasn't quite ready to they, deal the with. The court wasn't quite ready to deal with. Yeah, that. affirmative action in higher education. Um, well, uh, I think we're just about out of time. Oh, maybe a few more minutes. So maybe we could open up if folks have questions about anything we've talked about or other aspects of Senator Gordon's practice at the U.S. Supreme Court. We have time for maybe maybe two questions or so. Yes. Did you ever make an argument or a, a statement that wound up being put back in the opinion almost verbatim? You know, they, they said, that's it. And then people, wow, I got goosebumps. I wish I could say yes, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes. Let me just repeat the question quickly because no. uh, uh, the, for the cameras. Uh, so uh, after I assume the Bush v. Gore decision is sort of what you're referring to, it did sort of caused a lot more people maybe to think that the court was purely political. Is there any hope that the uh, partisan gerrymandering cases that are going there right now will, will alter their views about the court? In the latter part of the question, I think the answer is uh, very much yes. Almost. If the Supreme Court gets the courts into partisan, partisan gerrymandering, it will be very difficult for the courts not to be deemed politi partisanly political as, uh, as, as they go at it. I guess, uh, ironically, I have a, a sort of a different view on, on, on gerrymandering, not from a legal point of view, but from a practical point of view. I think the state of Washington has the best system in the United States for redistricting for Congress and uh, for the legislature uh, because four people do it and they're evenly divided between the two parties. You, we cannot have a partisan gerrymander here uh, in this state. Uh, we can and we do have a system uh, which pays attention to incumbents and doesn't arbitrarily separate them from their constituencies. But we have never had a challenge to the way redistricting has been done in this, a court challenge to the way redistricting has been done in this state since we went to our present system. And it, it, my own view is uh, that the reason that there are so many one-party districts across the country is that Americans have segregated themselves by party. Uh, 
you know, I, I can tell you as a Republican redistrictor the last time around, I couldn't possibly draw a competitive district in the city of Seattle. <laughs> didn't matter, it didn't matter to me, to be very blunt with you, where the lines went on, on, on districts here. You care only about the places where, where shifts in particular geography can control the outcome of the election. And those are far more rare than the general, uh, the general um, perception of redistricting indicates. Do we have time for any more questions, Lindsay, or should we wrap maybe one more question from the, from the audience? Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, I, I think it's kind of special today that we have folks sitting on I the can't hear you, Carrie. So, so the question is about the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court granted cert today in a case where the state of Washington is seeking uh, certiorari, and it's a case that's, <laughs> that Senator Gordon uh, uh, handled for, for many years uh, and was first argued at the U.S. Supreme Court in 1979. The case has literally been going on for 47 years, 48 years now, um, started in 1970 and has been up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, this will be the second time. Uh, the first time was the Bolt decision about sort of the allocation of fish, and this one is more about um, uh, what other... What other well, what the consequences of that allocation are. essentially sort of does the does the treaty require do the treaties require that there be a certain number of fish available um, and who and whose burden is that is that the state's burden or the federal government's burden and and uh, um, what else to say about that I mean I, I think uh, I've been taking notes today on how to argue at Supreme Court because apparently I'm gonna have to do that maybe later this spring for the first time uh, uh, um, uh, and you know, I've got a lot of a lot of good good tips here to uh, to go on. But you know, a little nervous about all this talk about the first time is usually a disaster. Or, uh, but <laughs> but you know, um, I think that's uh, just something that the attorney general attorney general Ferguson said earlier. I mean, one of the one of the funny things about sort of public law practice, and I'm sure Senator Gordon can speak to this, is that. Um, you generally get thrown into things much faster than you do in uh, in private practice. And uh, the dean, you know, mentioned that when I took this job, I had not done an appellate argument. And uh, you know, when we hire people into our office, into the attorney general's office from private law firms, it's often hard to explain to people in our office that you could really be a pretty good lawyer in a private law firm and not actually argue a case. You know, for your first seven or eight years there, um, people in our office just can't fathom that 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 you could work somewhere as a lawyer for that long and not you know argue a case. And uh, so anyway, it'll be interesting to see, sort of off topic. But Senator Gordon, any, any, uh, any tips on arguing uh, uh, for a first time, for a first time advocate at the, at the US Supreme Court? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that note, uh, did you have any lucky socks or anything that you wore when you, uh, or uh, any, any, you know, well, always knock on the door on the way in or anything? Just make that you... sure you're, you're, you're well prepared. As okay. Sure you will. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Senator. Thank you to our other panelists very much, uh, Professor Watson, Professor Snapper. Thanks so much, and I hope everyone enjoyed the panel. Thank you.